Hello, beautiful community. It's a pleasure and a privilege to have you with me for a conversation about the escalating drama around Mr. Prigozhin. I think it's reached a point where we could be looking at the main channel video on Mr. Prigozhin. The situation is a, a case of things mildly getting out of control. And I emphasize the word mild because the perception that this is things unraveling and coming apart in the Russian state is at this stage mistaken. So I've written a little thread really for you that we'll go through now um, in connection really with Prigozhin's latest outburst that was in one respect new but overall just in connection with the escalation of that conflict between the Russian MOD and Prigozhin and what it means and what lessons we should take away from what we are seeing. So um, we'll just read it through together and I'll make some comments as though we're having a cup of tea together, a cup of coffee together. Let's go. Prigozhin, a fake Kremlin-controlled revolutionary turned real one? Not quite, not quite. Um, although a little. So let's try to get to the bottom of this. Um, some wider context. It's extraordinary, and it is extraordinary, that Putin said to Prigozhin, you can go to the penal colonies and you can extract tens of thousands of people from there. That is an extraordinary kind of necessitated act of faith that is more appropriate to a scenario of not war but civil war. Why did Prigo, um, insofar as he had a choice, get into this? I think there are a lot of answers to this, but a cartoonish thing to say is that he thought that he could advantage himself via getting involved in a war that would be won. But now, of course, that's not the situation that he and the Russian state are in. Now the Kremlin's war looks unwinnable, short of a collapse of Western support for Ukraine. We'll keep on talking about what that means and how to avoid that. And Russia is facing a stalemate or a defeat. Prigozhin's army, reputationally and practically, has become a meat mincer, which is that sort of now banally common expression used about them, a meat mincer for convicts. Um, and now, of course, it's that plus, with a, plus that with a massively depleted resource. Prigozhin's most recent intervention is distinctive because it blames the war itself on Shoigu, etc. Um, so, it, 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 it's a more fundamental critique of the build-up to the war. And that critique is directed at the Ministry of Defense and particularly Shoigu. So what's Prigozhin's game? What purpose do his interventions serve for the Kremlin? What are his ambitions? And how, is this, how far is this getting out of control? For the Kremlin, Prigozhin's usefulness is as a fake revolutionary who redirects blame for the war going badly from Putin to Shoigu. So he's a kind of spoiler who dampens, redirects Z radical displeasure away from Putin. I think there is a, a number of functions, and here is a second one. Prigozhin is also functional for the Kremlin in a second sense. He gathers up resentment at state corruption and state incompetence, and the Kremlin hopes, hopefully, eventually, with a view to making that resentment and the demographics behind it more controllable. So that's actually a sort of role that the dead Zhirinovsky used to play. Um, he had a certain kind of script. The point is to attract more radical demographics and then track them and keep them in a certain bracket. <clears throat> 
Mr. Navalny himself has recently pointed out that Mr. Prigozhin is exploiting parts of his own message, which is interesting. And that's not disconnected with our conversation about how far it's necessary to do a much better job for everybody, but above all for the Russian opposition, to politicize the Russian space. Otherwise, well, we've got Mr. Prigozhin politicizing it. Now, what are Prigozhin's own interests? Well, his loyalty is divided between his organization, his army, whatever we call it, and the Kremlin. And also, of course, his personal ambitions of survival and the consolidation and formalization of his power. One of the things that he has been, as a matter of personal ambition, after is not so much to increase his power, but to consolidate it and formalize it. And some keen observers have pointed out an interesting trend whereby folks with more informal kinds of power um, in Russia have sought to formalize it. So one of the glaring examples of this has been the introduction into Putin's security council of one of the Kovalchuk brothers just in the last few months. So Prigozhin is forced to balance um, being an advocate for his army and serving the Kremlin, and these two often clash. Now, I'm not qualified to assess threats that Prigozhin might face from the criminal world for putting so many con convicts through the mi mi Minsa. Um, so because we're being quite rapid, let's just ask ourselves the question, has this balancing act got out, out of control? I think before we say anything in that direction, it's really important to put something very basic on the table that actually Mark Galeotti said in an interview that came out, came, came out yesterday on Times Radio, which I recommend. Um, it's, I'll, it's nothing radically new for those of you who are really, really on the ball, but it's a fantastic concentration of really healthy, um, condensed, explanations in just a 25 minute slot. It's as good a short to medium length interview for the general audience um, in English that I've watched this year. So big ups to Mark. Um, so what's this thing that we've got to bear in mind? You see, the drama of the conflict between Prigozhin and the Russian MOD is less surprising to Russia experts. Um, because it is simply an intensification and a transference into the realm of war of Putin's age-old divide-and-conquer technique that's been central to keeping Putin's, Putin in power. The, these are things you've got to take very seriously because we, we laugh and we laugh and we laugh and the Russian opposition laughs and laughs and laughs at the Putin regime, but they're not in power, it is. So we've we got to understand that we're looking at a combination of extravagant incompetence, but also high competence, looking at the Putin regime. In the years running up to the war, Putin's power was in a certain sense overestimated in the West. We had a, an excessively verticalized image of that regime. And here I used to give this sort of um, counter narrative, counter image of a ship called Putin, on which Putin stood with the tag captain, but on which he didn't quite have all the powers of a captain. But folks on the boat pretended that he did. So he was acting as a kind of referee, outsourcing power to various members of his court, who had various more or less formal, often pretty informal roles. And then arbitrating their conflicts. So he was delegating the powers of his office, construed in a, in a you know, pretty uh, informal way too, of course, because the, we're looking at something that's a blend of um, uh, a situation you can describe in procedural terms and just a kind of a criminal organization sort of picture which needs a much more ad hoc description. So he was acting as a referee, outsourcing power to various members of his court and then arbitrating these conflicts. Some people speculate, and in fact 
it's my view that, that that was part of the story. Some people speculate that a part of Putin's rationale for war, and don't forget this is to a very large extent a war about regime security, not NATO expansion. It's a factor too, but, but we've got to emphasize the regime security story that keeps getting missed still. Um, well over a year into the war. Some speculate that a part of Putin's rationale for war was a product of his sense that his refereeing powers were to a degree slipping away from him. Right? And what we've been saying is that the war allowed Putin to grab back a great deal of power, but grab it back with a much more vulnerable hold. Right? So his power is more, power is more centralized again in Putin's hands, but it's more fragile now and of course there are there is also respect in which that's not true and one of the ways it's not true is a thread that runs through this very conversation we're having which is putin's slow dissolution um not just of any sense of stability over russia's borders but any sense of stability over the monopoly of organized violence sense of stability that the state is retaining that monopoly um So some speculate that that was part of why the war began. But even if this drama that Prigozhin is acting out is in some ways less surprising than it might be, what we're witnessing is still extreme. And I think the answer to the question of whether it's getting out of control is yes, a little bit. But I think the term I'd use here is mild if we're concerned about the general stability of the Putin regime. So we should say it is getting out of control, but we shouldn't exaggerate it, but we are going to follow it. Um, I say it should not surprise us to see Prigozhin leave the scene at a future or evaporate from the scene at a future moment when Putin finds it convenient um, to do so, when doing so will have the least number of downsides for Putin. But at the same time, even though that's probably the, the primary track of pr what plausible outcomes we're looking at, that Prigozhin eventually is evaporated out of the picture, um, I wouldn't completely rule out, you know, to, to, you know, I wouldn't reduce the flat zero prospects of pr Prigozhin um, staying on the scene, uh, the regime further destabilizing and him developing greater aspirations for power. I don't believe he has them now. I don't believe Prigozhin is sitting around saying one day I would like to be president of Russia after Putin or dictator of Russia after Putin. Um, but um, these are ambitions that can develop when the right circumstances arise. And on another episode, I think it's worth exploring um, the analogies and disanalogies um, between the figure of Prigozhin and interestingly the figure of Beria. So I promised that conversation at some point. Meanwhile, we'll keep following what's going on. Um, look forward to being with you very, very soon. Thank you for being with me today. Lots of love and talk soon.